Okay, hi everyone. We're just gonna wait for a few more people to come online. But it's good to have you join us. Okay, so we'll start in, let's say in about two minutes, then we'll start. So everyone keep joining in. I know not all of us as panelists, how have you all been doing? I'll start with you, Michael, how are you doing? Doing all right. I know that you're um, calling in from Switzerland. Yes, um, we're still here in Switzerland. Um, the situation here is getting um, better. I think we've sort of made it through the peaks. Um, schools are reopening next week already, um, so sl slowly the society is getting back to work. Okay, and then Eleni, are you still in Greece or yeah. now in, in UK? Still in Greece, uh, enjoying the sunshine. Uh, things here also seem to be opening up. I think there's a little bit of fear around, you know, how quickly the recovery is going to happen and if we're going to have a second wave, but uh, small shops have opened up again, and yeah, it's kind of kind of nice to know that you can go outside if you want to. Uh, yeah, so that must be nice. <laughs> because, Mesh, I know you're in South Africa, so yeah. with me, so we have not been allowed to go out for a while. Yes. How are you doing on your side? Look, I think I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm not alone, so I'm not isolating by myself. I'm with my family. <laughs> So okay. it's, it's been quite a family time, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, at least. So awesome. So now that everyone has kind of joined us, I'd love to welcome all of you to this Green Recovery Series that we decided to do it as a fundraiser um, for UNICEF. And a lot of times people can be on the front line and they donate food. Um, and they're actually really on the front line, but we thought, what do we do best? Mm -hmm. Which is really talking about green buildings and sustainability and sustainable development. And how can we um, use that to raise as much as we can? So thank you to every single one of you for being a part of this fundraiser. Um, what I'll do is I'll just get each of the panelists to introduce themselves. But before we do that, I'd love to get a sense of who is attending. So if everyone who's the attendees could please just chat in the chat group Say your name and let us know what country you're from. Because I know I can already see that we've got people from Zimbabwe. Um, we've got some from Ghana. I know, Michael, you said you're from Ghana, so we've got some streaming in. Um, we also have some from Nigeria. Um, we've got someone dialing in from the United States. So if you could please just put in the chat where you're from so that we can just get a sense of who you are. Okay, awesome. Michael, we'll start with you. Just an introduction of what you do um, so that we can get the discussion going. All right. Well, hello to everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, uh, wherever you're dialing in from. My name is Michael Ofosuhine Wise. I'm Ghanaian, like very mentioned, and I work with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, um, which is a global CEO led organization. Uh, based here in Geneva, and, and the aim is basically to work together with these businesses um, to transition to a more sustainable world. My work is specifically on climate policy, so I work with um, companies on the policy side and working um, with the government to ensure that, you know, policy landscapes remain favorable for sustainable action from business. Okay, brilliant. So lots of questions are going to come your way, I think, today. I had quite a few people who already started asking me questions. I won't say his name, but your. Um, he messaged me already to say, I want to understand more about sustainable development. Is it only about green? Is it only about environmental? Um, so I think there'll be quite a few discussions in that direction. Mash, if you could please introduce yourself. I will do so. Hi, I'm Masho Gane, Masho Ramositeli, and I am a journalist, a business journalist for Forbes Africa. I'm also a lead strategist for Publicis Group Africa, which is a global advertising firm, and I look after a number of global brands um, on the continent. So yeah, that's what, that's what I do. Okay, awesome. And Mash is really going to speak a lot more about social sustainability and inclusivity and what that looks like. Because when I was having a conversation with her, she immediately said, what about inclusivity? What about the youth? Um, are we gonna have a green recovery that suddenly starts to exclude the majority of the population? Because already the population or um, the economy wasn't as sustainable. So um, that's what Mash will speak a bit more about. And then Eleni. <laughs> 
Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Eleni Vulkarinyagul. Um, I am part of Sphira, which is an EDGE certification partner for the World Bank uh, International Finance Corporation. So EDGE is a green building program and it aims to make every single building on this planet green um, and make that accessible to everybody. So we work on certifying those buildings as green alongside our partner, SGS. And in my nightlife, I do a lot of uh, climate activism and uh, <laughs> policy work in my local community in London where I'm based and also around the world through a program called, called the Climate Reality Leadership Program. Okay, awesome. So Lenny, speaking a bit more about green buildings and also what I had mentioned a bit earlier is that we'll be speaking a lot more about the property and construction sector during this month, um, mostly because if you look at the lockdown, for instance, in South Africa, property and construction still hasn't opened up. So we still can't come on site, which means that the green recovery might look a lot more prominent for the property and construction sector. So that's kind of where the discussion is going. I already see we have a question. So if you do have questions for any of our panelists, um, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom call, because um, we'd love to take on a lot of your questions. So I'll just start with you, Michael. Um, specifically looking that you're working with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. What is sustainable development? I'd love to already answer the question that we got before the session even started. What yeah. is sustainable development? Is it only about environmental? What does that look like? So let's try to get the definitions um, because that's going to help us with the rest of the series. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think this is very important to really set that one on one um, sustainability de definition before we get into the depth of the conversation. Um, I think just, you know, understanding the current geological age that we're in, the science couldn't be any more clear, right? Um, that a lot of the human activities that we're engaging in, whether be it for trade, be it for development and you working in buildings, you know, that the human settlements and the built, built environment spaces um, are predominantly what is having an impact on the natural environment. Um, so here at WBCSD, the work that we do really looks at sustainability along those two broad um, areas. One, around people living well, and that's a broad umbrella, which I'll address. Um, people living well, but also developing within what we call the planetary boundaries. Um, right? So when we look at sustainability, we look at it through the broad lens of the entire sustainable development goals, which has elements that you know, deal with society, with the economy, but also with the natural environment. So when we talk about sustainability, it's not only about you know, the environment, nature, biodiversity side of the, of the, you know, the whole equation, but it also looks, about, um, it looks into the societal issues. How do we um, develop in a way that lifts um, the social floors, but does that in a way that you know keeps us within um, the boundaries of the planet that we are not you know extracting um, resources um, and developing in a way that you know will irreversibly damage um, the planet that we in a way need to sustain life um, because we need to help society we need to develop together to ensure that by people living well people have access um, to education to good health um, to well-paying jobs and a general sense of well-being, uh, but we can't do that at the detriment of um, the natural system. So I think, yeah, in a nutshell, that sweet spot, that delicate balance between people living well um, and developing while maintaining that the boundaries of the planet which is sustaining our life is also very much respected is where you can find um, true sustainability. Okay, and so like based off how you're defining it, would you say that even before COVID, we were living sustainably. Because a lot of people now are saying everything is crashing, but was everything kind of going in the direction of crashing anyway? So what would um, you kind of say? Question. And I, I think, I mean, that's what the COVID pandemic has, you know, done for us, is kind of taken a little bit, the, you know, the veil of our eyes. Um, because like I said, the science has been clear to us for quite a, quite a while. Um, the IPCC, which is the Inter uh, governance, Governmental Panel, uh, sent us a good signal in 2018 when they published a special report from 1.5, which um, was a clear signal that the way the world is going is going to have an irreversible impact on, 
on the environment and the climate specifically if we didn't um, undertake clear and deep decarbonization across all systems. Um, a few months after that, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity, IPSAS, also published a report on you know, the impact of um, human activity on biodiversity. And one of the key um, lessons was, I mean, from that report was the fact that um, close to a million species you know, were, were going to be um, on the verge of extinction. So these signs uh, have been coming from the scientific community over, over a while now. And um, you know, the approach to, to sustainability has more or less been you know, very lip servicey. Um, yeah. you know, in the form of commitments without any real follow through. So what the pandemic is doing right now is really, you know, stress testing how we've acted on sustainability. And I think it's safe to say that along many of the indicators we have failed. And so that's, you know, really how we need to think about the future. And that, that's also why I mean, this session is very crucial. How do we think about moving forward? What kind of future do we want, you know, to, to project? We can't keep on addressing sustainability the same way we've done in the past. Exactly, and I think that's exactly the point of this session is what kind of future do we want to project? And also what kind of future do we want to build? And that kind of speaks a bit to what you're doing, Eleni, in terms of um, would you say that we've been sustainable in the way that we've been building our buildings? Um, and based off that, would you say that what the coronavirus has really done is started to expose things because buildings are such a large contributor to climate change. Um, so would you say that we've been sustainable and what impact would buildings really have um, in terms of helping to alleviate yeah. a lot of the problems I mean, that we're having? I, I will echo Michael that I think we're, we're not living sustainably and we haven't been for a very long time. Um, and there's major changes that need to happen for us to really be able to mitigate the damage that we are heading towards. Um, buildings play a really big chunk um, of global greenhouse gas emissions. So buildings are about 15% um, as of 2000, I think 11 or 12 data. So they could be even more right now. Um, and I think buildings are an interesting one because they're something that we take for granted, but we're in them all the time. Yeah, <laughs> Whether exactly. you're at work or at home, and especially now being in lockdown, you're starting to realize the role that a building plays in your life. And it's really, I think, lockdown has brought to light, particularly the inequality around buildings. So mm -hmm. the people that are suffering the most, the people that are most vulnerable are also in buildings that aren't particularly healthy for them right now and aren't really helping them. They don't have access to green spaces if they can go outside, for example. They, they are in very small spaces that might not be ventilated well, et cetera. So what we're seeing is in this lockdown, these inequalities of buildings just being exacerbated. But there's a significant opportunity. And I think the vision that EDGE brings and the vision that for me got me really excited about buildings. So I didn't originally have a background in buildings, but okay. EDGE kind of gave me a glimpse into a future where every building could be green. Because what we've been doing right now is that green buildings are luxury goods. They're the really high level Amazon, Google headquarters of the world <laughs> covered in solar panels and green roofs and, and they look beautiful. Yeah. But, but how can we make that accessible to everybody around the world? And how can it be every social housing unit, every residential unit, every little supermarket and store and hotel and office and you know, hospital actually having the elements of being both a healthy place to be in, but also a green building because those buildings are gonna be there for a hundred years. They don't you know, go up and down in a day, they stay there for a long time. Um, so I think you know, as we reimagine the future and as we think about the green recovery, in the past, you know, recovery has looked a lot around infrastructure. So building bridges or roads or um, areas to help kind of reinvigorate the economy. Could we be looking at a recovery where we, we are reinvigorating, reinvigorating the economy by looking at greening existing infrastructure, existing homes and uh, buildings, yeah. but also building those green buildings moving forward. And I think it's interesting because you said the question of, um, or the statement of how can we make it more accessible to everyone? Um, and we'll probably touch on that a bit more when we speak about some of the challenges with the green recovery, because I know there's quite a few who are attending, because I, I recognize some of the names, um, who would often have arguments with me about buildings cost more, green buildings cost more. Why should they do it? Why should it even be a priority? And now with so many people who 
may be feeling the pressure of the coronavirus, um, is, should it be a priority? So we'll definitely get back to that now. But just following up on that, Mash, in terms of inclusivity, so same question to you, have we been going in a sustainable trajectory um, when it comes to just how we've been growing as Africa and, in, and economic growth as Africa? Have we had inclusive, sustainable economic growth? In your Thank opinion. You, that is a very good question. And really the word to, to focus on is inclusivity. And the way I see it, I, I see it in two parts. The first part is that um, the word inclusivity in the economic space has really been removed from how businesses and the government sees economic growth. And so for a very long time, the green economy has almost been seen as a a nice to have, a, a something that you can put on your triple bottom line at the end of the year and say tick versus being seen as part and parcel as of the engine that will grow societies, that will grow businesses and that will grow profits. And what I'm seeing in my sector from even a marketing and advertising perspective, 35% of consumers are, are interested and are looking to purchase from brands that show sustainability mm. in terms of the way they source their, their inputs and right through to production all the way to distribution and selling it to the consumers. The second part that I see it really is, is through the lens of COVID-19. And COVID-19 has brought this opportunity where a lot of industries, sectors, and economies have halted. And this has given us an opportunity to almost to reset, you know, to start from scratch, if that makes sense, you know. Yeah. And the types of conversations that are being explored and should continue to be explored are decentralization and hyperlocalization. And when you talk about hyperlocalization, you're really looking at how can we reinvest in township economies. As Eleni mentioned, a lot of these township economies or informal settlements are overcrowded with buildings and property that is not good for the health of the people who are living in them, nor for the environment. And so how do we start empowering the, 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 the communities within these informal sect sectors um, and the areas that they live in? And particularly in Africa, you find that there's a lot of property that is left um, unused you know so instead of reusing buildings that are existing we build more yeah, buildings you that know? is true <laughs> the opportunity that exists now with COVID-19 that everything has halted is how can we use the existing buildings and almost refurbish them in a green and safe manner that can serve the communities that they exist in okay and that's exactly that's exactly it because we find that before COVID, we definitely were having a very consumerism mindset. We just wanted to build more. We wanted to use more. We wanted to eat more. I mean, I don't know how many people have changed their clothes since being in lockdown. I think people have kind of stayed in the same pajamas for the last two weeks. Um, and so I think that now we're starting to be more conscious about, wait a minute, the way that I've been living, has it been sustainable? And how can we do it differently? Instead of just ticking boxes, how can we do it differently? And so that kind of brings me to um, Michael again. So just in terms of business, what were some of the challenges that you would say? Oh, and just a quick note, I see that there are some questions in the chat. If you could please ask them in the Q&A, that makes it a lot easier for us to navigate. Um, and we'll definitely have a look at the questions closer towards the end of the session. Um, but Michael, just in terms of ticking the boxes and businesses, what would you say were some of the challenges that businesses were having in terms of having achieving sustainable development, especially within the framework of the SDGs. And really like quickly, because this would take an entire session to really just talk about the challenges and how to overcome them. But maybe just high level, maybe if you just pick one great challenge that businesses were having, and how would you say they could have overcome that challenge or they can overcome that challenge? Um, and specifically in the African context where we have competing priorities. Um. Well, I'll just, yeah, use my experience and you're right. Um, there are so many uh, challenges. We could spend the whole hour talking only about challenges, <laughs> but I will try and break it down into perhaps maybe two um, or three and um, take the broad approach of just the internal challenges and perhaps, you know, the external facing ones as well. Um, yeah. So looking at the internal challenges, I mean, the companies that I work with mostly um, have the issue of internally aligning, you know, within the entire business. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of companies that have, you know, a sustainability agenda, 
run by two or three people in the sustainable development, right? And that is something that it doesn't translate through the entire organization. So they seem to be in the corner pushing their own agenda. Meanwhile, you have other people in the, in the, in the organization, the CEO on the board level, uh, mid-level management and the actual employees who have to go out and implement these things, not exactly knowing and buying into the entire idea of, you know, moving towards that sustainability um, yeah. goal. So that seems to be one of the major things and that internal alignment is very key um, to ensure that every single person within that organization is on board with the journey, be it for climate, be it for, um, you know, equality within the company, be it, you know, yeah. just inclusion within the, within the company. Um, and that's one of the things that we do to help companies um, align this goal throughout the entire company. So that's one. And the second um, problem or challenge, which is, yeah, perhaps one of the biggest really is the policy landscape. Um, okay. Right? Because in most cases, companies, even those that are forward thinking and leading and would like to come on uh, this sustainability journey, specifically on climate, um, yeah, find it difficult to get incentives or, you know, um, other reasons why they should invest in, for example, renewables um, when their peers and, and, you know, and peers in sectors, in most cases, are still reliant on fossil fuels and other, you know, relatively cheaper um, ways of, of, of getting their energy, which makes them, in the end, not the most competitive, right? So it's really about you know, getting the landscape or the policy landscape to support these companies who are taking the initiative um, to be more green, to be more sustainable, um, and helping them, you know, showing solidarity in, in the kind of work that they're doing so that um, at the end of the day, they will have the confidence to move. And then finally, it's around, you know, leveraging this activity with investors as well. A lot of, a lot, a lot of the work that companies do at the end of the day, depend on how well they are also able to meet the investor demand. Investors want, want their money quickly uh, and investing in some of these renewables and all of these uh, sustainability, broad sustainability um, agenda takes quite a while to pay back. So they have to deal with investors um, and have, and in a way, navigate that long payback period. Um, and also just, you know, clarity in the standards and how they report, how they, you know, um, report on emissions, on things like you know social equality within the company, um, diversity within the company, um, yeah. all these things have to be reported in a way that will help investors drive the best decisions for the you know most sustainable companies. But if in most cases they are not aligned, and investors are like, you know, this is great, but we need to be able to compare it. We need benchmarks. We need clarity on how we can compare your you know your, the work you're doing on sustainability with other companies. So we also work in standardizing some of these efforts to make sure that the landscape is equal for all the companies. Okay, and that's so good. I mean, that's exactly why I said that that's almost an entire day. That's an entire workshop, just exactly. to be able to get people to align, to get the policy going, because in terms of sustainability, it has to be about the public sector, private sector, and research institutions all coming together to solve problems. Um, and then also obviously trying to incentivize because sustainability has often not seen as competitive. So I've actually seen that that's one of the questions that we've got, but we'll definitely get to that question. Um, I don't know, Eleni, if you could maybe speak into that in terms of the challenges that we have um, with green buildings. I know that IFC has got their green market transformation program. I mean, we've got the EDGE tool that tries to standardize what green is, because I know that just even on this call, we probably have, everyone has a different definition of green. I mean, I've had people say, it's if you paint the house green or whatever, and I'm just like, that's not funny. We've like, no, <laughs> let's not do that. Um, but everyone has got a different definition of green. And so I would ask you, Eleni, just to kind of preface the discussion that we'll have for this month, focusing on property construction sector. What are some of the challenges that have been faced in terms of trying to get green buildings? And or do they just basically align with what Michael said? Yeah. Because when I hear what he was saying, I was like, that sounds like all my clients. I'm kidding. No, my clients are great. But um, when I hear what Michael was saying, it's like, that's normally what we find is that there's misalignment. Policies are not, are not favorable and it might not be seen as competitive. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, Michael, you did a really, really nice summary <laughs> of the challenges, I think, from the corporate level. Um, so yeah. completely agree with you. And I think oftentimes we find ourselves in a chicken and egg situation where policy is waiting for business to 
to be more open to stronger policies than they'll do things and, and you kind of end in a situation where nobody does anything because everybody's waiting for somebody else to do something yeah um, which can be quite frustrating <laughs> um, but I think on the green building side um, what we're seeing in terms of edge is that the markets that are taking off the most with green buildings are the ones that have investors or banks offering uh, specific green finance programs and also yeah. policies from government offering additional incentives for um, organizations or developers that are building green. And really that combination is creating the opportunities in the space for people to be able to take that step into green. And I think a lot of times, you know, oh, I'm sure we'll get this into this later, but there's a perception yeah. that green is more expensive. And, and in some cases it is, and I, I you know, stand back on that. But, but in many cases, if you're thinking about it from the beginning, from the earliest stage, and you're designing something to be sustainable from the beginning, oftentimes you're finding cost savings along the way, and it actually does not come at an additional cost as to what it would have cost you to build something because you're thinking ahead and because you're designing something with that in mind. So it's more of that futuristic thinking as opposed to, you know, you built something with a specification that you already had, and then you're like, oh, I should make it green. And then you start adding things on. And then of course it's going to be expensive because it wasn't designed in a specific way. Um, but I think I've seized on a, a really good job from, from the element of alignment um, because Edge is a tool that was built to be global. So it's a free software tool that's available for 190 countries. Um, which is probably the most broad definition of a green building, um, just in terms of having one standard um, idea of it, because oftentimes green buildings are very country specific. So this, yeah. is, this is global and it's very quantifiable. So kind of speaking to Michael's point around investors wanting data and information and proof that something is green, um, IFC, because it's a bank and because they are investors, um, have built this program to be something that's easily um, quantifiable and you can easily extract information around CO2 savings, energy savings, et cetera. Um, yeah, so really okay. that, I think, is trying to solve the problem that Michael mentioned. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Um, and I think just because there's so many questions and we keep getting quite a few <laughs> questions. So what I'll do is I'll ask Mash one last question, then I promise I'll get to all the questions. Um, or we'll see. Let's see if we can do that in about 30 minutes. Um, Mash, so kind of hearing the challenges, knowing that we've got competing priorities in Africa, um, for instance, should government, you know, should they spend on solar panels or should they be spending on textbooks? You know, so kind of knowing that we've got competing priorities, would you, how would you, because obviously as a strategist and kind of being very good at integrated strategy, almost in like a line or high level, how would you suggest that we navigate these competing priorities in sustainable economic growth? And that almost sets a, pre a preface for kind of future conversations. What next, basically? How do we navigate all of this? So the, the challenge that you mentioned is a, is a very big one for Africa, right? Um, simply because a lot of governments have the pressure of delivering economic growth and social well-being in the term of one sitting president, which is what, three to five years? Um, so in a, in a short, high level, I would say plug and play. We are not gonna be able to overhaul the unsustainable processes that currently exist. However, where the opportunities exist, we should definitely leverage and invest in those. Um, I just quickly wanna speak onto what coronavirus and how we dealt with the challenge of coronavirus um, has opened up in terms of opportunities. The one thing that has been very clear during this lockdown was the fact that food wastage is a big, is a very big problem in terms of sustainability. Yeah. And South Africa, um, a third of all food produced in South Africa goes into land landfills, which obviously um, emit your gases yeah. in terms of methane gas, carbon dioxide, but also has a ripple effect in terms of over farming. So really there it's a it's a very quick low hanging opportunity for governments to plug in sustainability in terms of how can they partner with organizations with the private sector in terms of minimizing food wastage right from the factory in terms of how can we build businesses that work with food companies that create um, loss, of, loss of food wastage in their processes. How do we, um, in terms of when it's at the retail stores and it's about to expire, instead of them pouring them out, just before yeah. the it's about to expire, how do we re redistribute to those that are hungry? Because we know in Africa, 
food wastage where we have a population that is hungry and during pre and during pro, um, COVID, this has been really, really amplified. And so there are opportunities that exist in, in Nigeria, um, almost 50% of all small scale farmers lose their crop due to uh, not having cold storage. And there's entrepreneurs that are using solar panels to create store, cold storage rooms. Really, again, speaking to that fact that there's food wastage, how can we use the green economies to, to, to fill in that gap? And even in the case where every mouth is fed in Africa, every tummy is full and there's still food wastage what we find is that we could still use that for bioenergy you know um the current um food wastage in south africa it has been estimated to um power up the whole of the johannesburg city one of the biggest economic okay. hubs on the continent so really plug and play look where there's an opportunity coronavirus has really opened up our eyes to um where the existing challenges are from an entire um, green sustainability aspect, not just in property, and how do you plug into that um, currently and then move forward? Yeah, exactly. And I think it's so interesting because um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but a lot of people are now saying instead of having that linear economy, maybe now's the time to start changing our economy to become a circular economy, which speaks into what you're saying, Mash, in terms of food waste and speaking to each other and seeing waste actually as a resource. And the resource that it is. I think that that's also, I mean, it's even one of the pillars that you guys have is WBCSD, um, Michael, in terms of the circular economy. And so I definitely think that's probably another discussion <laughs> that we're actually end up going through with. Um, there's, quite a, there's quite a bit that we can chat about. So I think let's take some of the questions that we have. So we'll go through the Q&A. Um, it's interesting because some of the questions are specifically directed to some of you. So it might have to be... <laughs> We might have to see how far we get. Um, but I'll just start with the first question that we got, we're getting from South Africa. And so what he says is that um, there is sentiment that sustainability would gain much greater focus and attention as we get back to kind of um, back to work abnormal because life is changing a bit. And his question is, do you foresee that there will be a lot more decentralization happening once the dust from COVID has settled. So do you see that things will start being more centralized and more consolidated, which may even start to lead to vacancies within buildings? Um, I think that might probably go to you, Michael. So where do you see that going? Um, I think, well, it's, it's still very early to say, uh, right? Because um, we're not sure, first of all, how long this thing is going to last. We are also not sure if there's going to be a second wave and resurgence once you know, people start coming back. Um, one thing we are sure of is that while we've been in lockdown, we are learning new behaviors, new activities, and um, our way of life has significantly changed. Um, that in a way could lead to businesses, you know, rethinking how they would move forward in terms of you know, how many people they actually need in an office. Um, we've realized a lot of organizations that in, in a million years didn't think, uh, you know, could transform their business um, to be working fully online are now yeah. completely switched um, to a cloud system. Um, big corporations with thousands of workers are almost now working at least like 60, 70% remotely. Um, so moving forward, companies and, and are going to have to rethink um, what it actually means to, to run a business. You need people to, you know, congregate in a space. Um, for eight hours before work gets done or, you know, these new norms um, can lead to new behaviors as well. And, and that's the thing that I, I was actually going to mention around the co-benefits of these kind of actions as well. It's yeah. in a way um, being propelled into the fourth industri industrial revolution, um, whether we want it or not. The rate at which we are, you know, leveraging key technologies is unprecedented, if I may use that word again. Mm -hmm. um, but um, indeed, there are co-benefits when it comes to sustainability as well. You know, you see how much energy savings you're, you're having in, for, for the business in, in those buildings that are no longer, you know, being run from eight to five, the number of emissions that staff um, are saving because they don't have to travel. Um, all of these benefits are something that company can now, you know, actually leverage um, and use 
to secure cheaper loans on you know green bonds and, and green investments as well. Um, so there there are core benefits, and that could facilitate you know this new world where sustainability becomes the the, the, the new norm. But I think it's still very early to to say. Okay. Um. So kind of following up on that, we've got a question from Mozambique where the question is then what is the future of office buildings with the pandemic in mind? Are we going back to normal or is there a new normal? And how will that improve the sustainability of these buildings? But now if you're looking at sustainability, remember it's economic, social, and environmental. Um, so what is like, what will happen to the offices? I know that that's an entire discussion. So we're actually gonna chat about that next week um, with the state intel, but kind of overview, what next with offices? Like I said, I, I think it's too early to say. I, I can't yeah. say a definitive answer. I, I don't. I don't. I, I don't think. Yeah, there is a right or wrong answer because we just have to watch how the situation unfolds. Um, yeah. My my only issue with how you know these spaces will evolve, and especially within the context of Africa, um, well, I would draw some inspiration from what uh, uh, Marshall Kane was saying earlier about inclusivity, right? Because um, all of these um, places of work have usually have, you know, some auxiliary workers, right? Um, cleaners, um, staff who need to be present and need businesses to go on so that they can also take care of their families. So now that, you know, businesses are revising how they approach these things, how do they make sure that these new plans um, to save on energy, to save on, on CO2 emissions through travel do not come at the detriment of these vulnerable people who actually rely on being in the office so that they can come and clean and so that they can come and, you know, help out. So they need to be also included in those plans um, to make sure that they are not left out. And that's, you know, a whole conversation on, on what we refer to as a just transition to sustainability. So how does that transition to this new era of sustainability remain just and make sure that no one is left behind? Yes. Okay. That's a very good answer. Mash, do you want to add to that or would you like me to go to the next question? I'd like to quickly add on that um, yeah. and, a, a little, and a bit touch on decentralization. I think one of the things that um, property developers need to think about is what can their value add be to, to the corporates that they obviously have clients of. So, you know, tenant installations could be a way that uh, property developers can look at um, cost saving for their current client base, you know. Um, mm -hmm. We know that in Africa, electricity um, is a supply that isn't always guaranteed, but the one thing that we have all aligned is that if anything should remain on is um, Wi-Fi and connectivity. And so maybe if I'm a, if I'm, instead of using generators to power up your wireless and your data, et cetera, use solar panels. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's a new value proposition that um, property developers need to look at specifically for their clients. Um, if mm -hmm. you add solar, solar installations, you might save them even costs from an electricity um, spending. And then from a decentralization perspective, again, speaking to the fact that there are abandoned buildings in your township um, economies, I think there's an opportunity, especially when it comes to the travel of um, employees to look at how we decentralize where people work, whether it is using those buildings to almost create a resource hub where people can work in terms of connectivity, in terms of um, equipment, if they don't have that equipment at home, or whether or not they can just go work there just to, to be a quiet, productive place. Because as mentioned, um, in, the, in, in these areas, there's like 10 people in the house, five people in the house. So yeah. it could be very distracting to work. So that's another opportunity from a township and inclusivity to really redevelop those buildings, use them as um, work spaces, and just, re again, recreating different models. It helps with the people who already live in those communities to maybe just not travel and emit more greenhouse gases and just really travel five kilometers versus currently 20 to 30 kilometers to your central economic hubs. Okay, and that's exactly, there's, okay, there's quite a few questions about building. So I'm gonna try to get to them because that's exactly it. A lot of questions that are coming in are saying, how do we repurpose the way that we've been doing? Um, a lot of questions coming in are saying, Will there even be a new normal? Like, what will that look like? Or will we go back to business as usual? And will we go back to the normal? Um, and then there are some questions on technology, which we'll try to see if we can touch on. But Eleni, the question that we have for you from South Africa is, are there any um, practical cases or bits of data which support the view that tenants choose 
green buildings over traditional buildings? And what are some of the economic parameters that drive this decision? Because obviously trying to convince a property owner or developer, especially now when there's such a crunch and so much pressure that's coming because of the coronavirus and because of vacancies and defaults in terms of rental payments, um, is there anything that can kind of convince a, a, a property developer to say that you'll get more tenants um, because you're in a green building or something along those lines? So is there any data on that? Yeah, so there have been some studies and I'm completely blanking on the names of the people that have done them. But then also IFC has put together um, a really long report and they released at the end of last year, uh, the Green Building Transformation uh, Report that looks at the opportunity and what tenants want and kind of what investors want. So you can find that on the edgebuildings.com website um, that does have some information there. I think it depends on the market as well. Um, definitely what we see from a global level is that each market is at a different maturity level. And so the requirements from tenants, the requirements from investors vary so much country to country. And in the ones where there's a greater awareness and a greater drive towards meeting the sustainable development goals or being more green, you'll find that you'll have more tenants there that are asking for it because kind of going back in time a little bit to, to the question that Michael was talking around, you know, corporates aligning internally around their sustainability goals and actually taking serious action. Um, yeah. We are seeing more corporates having policies, for example, that they'll only occupy green buildings moving forward. Okay. Or that by 2030, there's a commitment, um, the EP100, where companies are signing that as of 2030, they would only be occupying or developing zero carbon assets. So it's still not a huge portion of companies. I think there's about 100 that have signed on to that, but that's gaining traction. And I think despite coronavirus and the crunch that we're seeing right now, the future is still green and we still have to be sustainable. That's not going away. It's the crisis that we will face once we get over this current crisis. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, that's why this recovery plan is so important now. And it's so important to think through the next steps because coronavirus hit us out of nowhere. We were clearly, and we're all kind of scrambling around to figure it out. The climate crisis we've known about and it's not going away and it's coming so we're still going to have to adapt similarly to the adaptations that we're going through right now but we have a chance to plan and we have a chance to think through how to do it in a way that doesn't crash economies around the world that doesn't leave people behind and that doesn't leave you know what we're seeing chunks and chunks of like populations that are being unemployed right now we have an opportunity to do this right and we're not going to get it perfect because we don't know everything but we can actually yeah. do it in a way that moves us towards the right direction yeah and i'm just thinking now even um michael i mean the council has got 200 ceo led businesses who want to be sustainable so they really want to walk on that journey um would you say that there's kind of like what would you say their driver is to say that, hey, I'm gonna put my hand up and I want to be more sustainable? Uh, well, I think there are you know, quite a few reasons why um, companies would want to join a, a, an organization like the WBCSD and to champion sustainability. And um, one is basically because the science has told us that this is coming. And if you are a business that wants to you know, be around by 2050, you need to start taking action on sustainability now. We've seen what is going on with the markets um, right now. And it's clear that those companies that are taking you know, ESG seriously, that are acting on e environmental, social and governance issues are performing way better than those that are not. So that is definitely yeah. one clear, clear reason um, that companies would like to be there. Some people want to also be ahead of the curve. Uh, I mentioned earlier around you know, the issues with the regulatory landscape. We've seen signals around the world that these regulatory um, shifts are coming. The EU is in the middle of you know, negotiating a very big um, green deal, um, which is going to set them on a pathway to climate neutrality. So the regulations are in, in, you know, in, in process, and businesses want to know how to navigate those. So they're not going to wait for those regulations to come before they start that journey. They are working with their peers, companies from other sectors to make sure that they understand, you know, the climate risk, the opportunities yeah. and the financial implications for them so that they can, you know, invest in, in the right kind of um, energy sourcing, invest in the right kind of buildings, um, invest in a future that will comply um, to, you know, the sustainability landscape. 
And I think the third one, and I'll just leave it at that, is also around you know, the social awareness we've seen around the world, the, the Gretas of the world, and the, you know, the masses that they're mobilizing um, to call on corporates to actually start changing. The demand from customers are shifting. Com customers are you know, looking for green cars. They're looking for green buildings. They're looking for green products. They want to you know, consume sustainable products. And if you're a business and you're not thinking about these things right now, you might have a market share, but it's not guaranteed in the next 15 years. So a lot of these yeah. companies um, yeah, are thinking along those long-term um, sustainable, sustainability goals and just making sure that um, they are in the right you know, group of companies that have set that level of ambition for themselves to learn from each other, to collaborate, to innovate, develop tools that they can leverage um, to be ahead of the curve. Okay, um, that's perfect because it actually speaks into the next question that we have. So one of the comments that we got um, from the chat, and please do feel free to keep chatting and just with questions, please put them in the Q&A tab. But it's from Cote d'Ivoire, and the comment is that the Ivorian building market is very much hard to change to sustainable unless they know it's going to bring them more tenants or unless there's an incentive. So we're finding that certain countries have that. So I think the question is um, for Eleni, because it leads on to another question we got from Nigeria. And the question is, um, specifically to you, Eleni, is given the marginal cost increases of building green, which already is a statement that maybe you might want to speak into, is there <laughs> really marginal cost increases of building green? Um, do you think that we can mainstream the practice in Africa? So can we really get green buildings in Africa? Um, if we're looking at environmental sustainability without providing access to affordable finance. And then the second point, which is answering two more questions at the bottom is, can we get green buildings without access to education? Mm -hmm. So there was another comment that said yep. that in schools, they're currently not learning about green buildings. They're not learning about sustainability. They're not learning about the SDGs. So given all of this, that the market is a little bit sticky and they know that there's an incentive, um, can, like, how do we get this in Africa? Can we, should we, should we just give up? Definitely don't give up. Um, and I like that the second set of questions kind of answered my thoughts on the first question. So <laughs> you're all thinking ahead, but I think, you know, the, the comment around the Ivorian building market is, is exactly the challenge. So it's very hard to have tenants demanding for green buildings if there isn't the education and awareness of, of the tenants and, and the broader community in the market. And that's what I was talking about earlier with the maturity in terms of if everyone's aware of green buildings and everybody's demanding green buildings, then it's creating a cycle where pe developers are building more green buildings and then more tenants are demanding yeah. and it's kind of all moving in tandem. When you don't have that, it's very difficult to kickstart green buildings and make them um, really commonplace. And I do think education plays a serious role, but absolutely, I think market drivers need to be in place. Um, I think, as, as I mentioned, you know, the markets where you have the most success are the ones where there's some kind of finance or some kind of government incentive. Um, I think IFC has been doing a good job in terms of working with local governments. Um, so I know last week they were talking to um, the Nigerian government around doing some incentives there. Um, they've been working across lots of different countries around Africa um, to try and put the foundations in place as well as different banks. Um, I think on the banking side, the investment community in general is moving towards ESG, as Michael mentioned. So they're yeah. looking for sustainability projects. They're looking for ways to put money towards sustainability. What's been hindering them in the past is being able to quantify that with buildings because buildings are a little bit complicated. Um, and if you're not an expert, it can be quite difficult to know what's actually a green building or what's, what's really contributing to the issue of climate change or um, mitigating the issue of climate change. Um, and again, that's, that's really the need for quantifiable information and information that can help investors make decisions and channel money. So if more investors are putting chunks of money aside to be green, whether that is preferential loans or not, even if they're just setting aside money that's saying that this is for climate change, um, that means that people and communities and developers will have access to more opportunities to be able to finance these green building programs. And I will say on the subject of the, the marginal cost, again, in some cases it is going to be more expensive, but that's not necessarily true. It's not the status quo statement that green buildings are more expensive. We're seeing social housing be, being built around the world 
that is green. It's possible. It's not a luxury good. It's absolutely accessible. It's just about thinking ahead and thinking strategically about how you design buildings to make sense in your climate. I think that's key as well. You know, you see what is seen as a beautiful building, for example, is a big glass building. Put that in a sunny country and try and cool that down. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. you've created a greenhouse. That's that's not appropriate for every climate and that can't be seen as, as the building that we're all striving towards. You've got to think local. And again, I think to, to Masha's point, that, that um, localization and, and really thinking about the community's needs um, is just another key part of this. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we have nine minutes and so many more questions. So we're definitely <laughs> not gonna have time to take them because I'd love each panelist to kind of give um, their final statement. But I think just touching on the topic of sustainability, the main idea of this whole conversation was to just start the conversation um, and specifically look at how do we define it. And also maybe to highlight that sustainability is not just environmental sustainability. Sustainability, as we can see, is economic sustainability, um, social sustainability, as well as environmental sustainability. So I think if we can just I mean, we haven't answered a lot of the questions because there's definitely more conversations to have from the nature of the questions. There is a lot about buildings and whether or not that's sustainable and how we can make it sustainable and should it be a priority. Um, but let's start with you, Mash, just in terms of your closing statement, in terms of can we get a green recovery in Africa? Is it worth pursuing? Is it worth us going further to understand what a green recovery would look like? Um, and in your opinion, what would a green recovery look like for Africa? So if you could, if you were the president of, okay, you're kind of president of a continent, but if you could oversee the whole continent of the AU, um, what would a green recovery look like for Africa? What are we leaving behind with COVID and what are we doing new going forward? Okay. So I think for me, right, the most important thing as to why we should push forward with the green economy is that it actually allows new participants within the economy, period. So a lot of the sectors that exist are very closed off because of existing monopolies or uncompetitive practices by the oligop oligopolies that exist. And so really you're finding that across sectors, um, female-led businesses, black-led businesses, or previously disadvantaged-led businesses aren't able to come into those sectors. Whether it's the fact that there's global organizations that have a heritage of 200 years within the continent. So with a green economy, and it being very much in its startup phase, what the government should do across the continent is really incentivize the growth of, of economies, regardless of which sector, that are led by black, female, or previously disadvantaged um, communities. It's an opening, right, for, for us. So I always say, I always think of it like this, instead of trying to knock on closed doors, let's open these doors that no one has opened. Even the, as we, we've had this conversation throughout this hour that existing businesses are str struggling and they're lazy for whatever reason, right, to move forward with the green economy. So instead of trying to open those doors, there are tons of entrepreneurs around the continent. We need to create policies that we communicate, that we say, guys, as the AU, as the different respective governments, we're putting policies and incentives for females to come up with businesses in, this, in these sectors that um, are sustainable and lead with the green economy. And from a, from a private um, procurement perspective, there's tax incentives if you procure from um, suppliers that have these sustainable models already. Eleni mentioned that when you start any project, from scratch with the idea of building it green, the costs are actually marginally the same. So we can, from an economic perspective, I think we have to drive it because it allows more players from uh, African participants to actually join the economy where right now the economies are closed for many, many, many um, young entrepreneurs, yeah. female entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs. Okay, so more inclusivity essentially is what a green recovery would look like and really starting to open up the market to people who are normally um, marginalized, not only in South Africa, but across the continent. Yes. And, um, across, and across, seeing how- Across, across, 
across mm. sectors. I have clients who are looking to um, do an overhaul in their packaging for more res for recyclable packaging. And they're finding that across the world, there is not enough producers of recyclable, um, of some recyclable packaging. That's an opportunity. Again, no one is doing yeah. it. And the existing packaging companies don't want to change because it might be expensive to change their factories and their manufacturing equipments. So it's an opportunity for new entrepreneurs to get in. Okay. I think that's an entire discussion in terms of this green recovery series. So I might get back to you on that. Um, Eleni, if you could define what the green recovery would look like, specifically with your experience in 190 developing countries, essentially, um, what, would, what would that look like? What would the green recovery look like? Yeah, I think for me, the green recovery is an opportunity to start from scratch and to connect dots that previously haven't been connected. So there's an opportunity right now that we can, we can take a blank slate. We can say these things haven't been working for so long and we continue to do them and we continue to go down the rabbit hole of a very, you know, over consumptive resource extractive society yeah. when, you know, actually this pause is a perfect time to say, if we do a little bit of this and a little bit of this and, and connect this and connect the dots, we can actually solve some of these challenges and do it in a more sustainable way. So I love the idea of the solar panels for the cooling storage to address the, the food waste. You know, again, it's just bringing, you know, what available technologies do we have? What resources as people do we have? So the entrepreneurs around the world, the small businesses, the medium-sized businesses, as well as the global corporations, how can we work together to really look to this new world, this new economy where we do things differently? It's an opportunity to let go of the past and, and to take the step forward into this world where you know, we're moving towards the future. Um, so for me, a green recovery is actually letting go of some of the past and taking it as an opportunity to, to bring some of the things together um, to move forward. Okay, that's great. Um, Michael, you have the last say. Um, <laughs> and I think in your opinion, what would a green recovery look like? And maybe I'm gonna add one last question which will kind of lead to our next sessions that we do within this green recovery series. Um, the question would be, can Africa, do we have the capability, do we have the capacity, in your opinion, to actually implement a green recovery? What do we need to do? Where do we start? Um, well, yeah, that's a loaded one. But <laughs> I, think, I think the short answer to answer the second question that you asked um, um, is yes, I think Africa, is in a position to um, leverage this situation. I don't want to call it an opportunity because I find it hard mm. um, just thinking about you know, everything that we're going through as an opportunity. So I would just like to say that I think we can leverage this moment um, based on you know, the resources we have on the continent, but also the global solidarity that we're seeing from a lot of organizations and, uh, and countries um, all around the world. We know that the IMF and a lot of these, um, yeah, organizations providing fiscal support have, you know, given us some tax breaks and incentives to, you know, get our things in order right now. So I would like to take a, a much broader approach to how we, you know, take, take this moment to build back better. I think the green recovery needs to really fit in that broader agenda of how we build back better. Um, the COVID pandemic has really, you know, stripped and exposed a lot of the flaws that we have in our way of life on the continent. Um, it's a health crisis that has shown us, you know, the fragility of our health system. It's shown us, um, you know, how people are living on the continent with absolutely no safety net. Um, it's shown yeah. us, you know, issues around access to water. You know, we're asking people to wash their hands for 20 seconds under the tub, but they, they don't even have a tub to begin with, right? So these flaws are all really uh, what has been exposed um, by the pandemic. And I feel like, um, you know, the recovery needs to start in the phase where we are addressing these um, fundamental and core issues, right? So we've seen examples of different governments realizing these challenges and in many cases starting to propose some solu solutions. So for example, the Ghanaian president has announced that he wants to build 88 new hospitals in the country. Right. So taking that approach, how do we then incorporate things of sustainability into that? How do we make sure that all those hospitals that are being built are built through the lens of 
um, sustainability. They are, you know, they remain green. They remain, they remain um, powered by, you know, renewable energy. Um, the people that are going to work on these buildings, do we have, you know, have to ensure that these are not, you know, the well-to-do in the society, but we also incorporate um, some of, you know, the people that are under the poverty line. Um, just, you know, to tie in that element of inclusivity that uh, Mashokani was mentioning earlier. I think we need to take this broad-based approach through the entire lens of, you know, the SDGs and ensure that we are, you know, building back a nation or a continent that is not only, you know, thinking about sustainability in, in, in the sense of the environmental way, because then that tends to be tone deaf, that tends to not have people at the center of it. Um, so definitely, I think we can build that better, but this has to be this holistic um, agenda. But just zoning in on, on, on just uh, perhaps the climate agenda, um, I think we are in a position as a continent to be, well, an emerging leader um, on, on climate, for example, because 2020 under the Paris Agreement is the year that countries are supposed to submit revised climate commitment, right? And we as a continent have the unique opportunity to build some of these actions that we want to do into our national adaptation plans, our climate change uh, plans, um, to submit to the UNFCCC. And there are financial frameworks within that whole framework that help developing countries. There is an allocation of close to 100 billion per year, which we can access to finance um, this sustainability agenda. Next year, I mean, the, COP, the climate change um, conference next year which was supposed to happen in africa has been has been delayed because you know the one that is going to happen this year hosted by the uk um won't happen because of you know the COVID situation um yeah. and that has given us one year to actually one extra year to get our house in order it has given us um, another year to really plan and you know perhaps go into that climate change conference as a leader in climate change with clear action plans on what we are going to do for the continent um so i think these are, you know, frameworks that are existing that we can leverage. Um, the, the way you framed the conversation, this whole conversation was actually good because the preamble was the fact that organizations like the IMF have come out saying that the long-term fiscal measures that they are going to give are all going to be screened through sustainability and climate change. So okay. as government, it's only natural that the African continent positions itself with clear, um, you know, sustainability agenda in, or, in order to access um, some of these funds as well. So definitely, I think we are in a position, we have the resources, we have the manpower, but I think the African continent is resilient enough to go through this, um, but it's not a given. We have to actually do the work and take this holistic approach. Okay, well, thank you very much to every single one of you for your time. Um, this has been very helpful in terms of just the first bit of the series, which is defining what the green recovery could look like. Um, and thank you so much as well to every single one of you who have attended. Um, we really wanted to do this, not only just to talk about the green recovery and get the conversation going, specifically for the context of Africa, because a lot of the conversation has been um, in Europe in terms of the Green Recovery Alliance. Um, so we really wanted to get the conversation going and also to get the conversation going for a good cause. So we thought that UNICEF would be a great beneficiary for a conversation like this because children are really the most impacted both by the pandemic, but also by climate change. So we really appreciate every single one of you joining the conversation. Um, for the rest of the month, we'll be focusing more on property, buildings, construction, and what the green recovery would look like for that sector, because the property industry has got a lot of potential to create new jobs, but it also has potential to recreate spaces so that there's equal opportunity for others, um, as well as the potential to mitigate our impacts on climate. So that's kind of where we're going with this discussion for this month. We do have all of your email addresses, so we will keep you updated on the next discussion. For next week, we'll have Estate Intel. Um, so Delapo will be joining us. And in the week after, we have Mick Pierce, who is an architect um, who did the first six star certified building in Australia, as well as in Zimbabwe, he did really good work with biomimicry. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you to the panelists. You guys have been amazing virtually. I love that we could link in from across the world, literally. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us as well.
थैंक यू द प्लेजर